Welcome, welcome, YouTubers. I am so glad you're here. We're going to be talking about avoidant men. I'm just putting that on the table right now. We were talking about avoidant men and love and relationships today. But before we get into all of that, I am glad that you're here. Thank you so much for helping me get to 40,000 subscribers. I almost, I, I, I was shocked when I saw how fast we got here. So thank you for your support. You guys are incredible. Keep in mind, once we hit 50,000, I am giving away a free coaching package to people who are in the audience, to one of you people out there that is supporting me. I am so grateful that you are here and so grateful for your kindness. I could not do this without you. So thank you. One of you at 50,000 is going to get a five session coaching package with me. I am happy to give back to this community. I'm going to make sure it's somebody that is, is commenting in live stream, somebody who is dedicated to learning about attachment. I want to give it to the person who is most eager and most in need of that work. So definitely going to be one of you guys. Thank you so much, so much, so much for being here. Jack, I see you over there in uh, in the chat. Thank you so much for being here. I see someone pumping those hearts over there as well. Thank you so much. Becky, good to see you. Welcome in here, chat. Sound off while you guys are out there. Well, no, sound on. Wait a minute, sound on. But call out in chat. Let me know that you guys are here. I love seeing you guys over there. Thank you so much for being here. Big thanks to my subscribers. Big thanks to the paying members on this channel who help support me as well. Sahara, I see you right there with a green tag. Thank you so much for being a member. Um, you've changed my life. Lena, you are so welcome. Thank you for being here. Vicky, good to see you as well. Tonight, avoidant men. Why do they reject love? Last night was, do they ever feel love? Tonight is, why do they reject it, right? Because it doesn't make sense. Why do they reject the one thing that every human being really is craving? Why do they, in fact, reject the one thing that they themselves are craving? I'm going to take you on an experience tonight that is going to show you, show you, not just tell you, show you why they are rejecting love, okay? I'm going to help you get into the mindset of an avoidant person. And if you're an avoidant person watching this video right now, a lot of you guys are totally with you. It is non-demonizing. I am not here to trash avoidant people. I'm also not here to trash anxious people. I'm here to help everybody understand each other. Alicia, hello. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Milda, thank you so much. I don't know that I've talked with you before in here, but welcome as a, as a, as a member on this channel. Lindsay, good to see you. Edith, glad you're here. Glad all of you are here. Caitlin Smith, good to see you especially. You've been around for quite a long time. Thank you so much. All right. Let's dig into this, okay? For all of you people, I know last night there was like 130 people on the live stream and I woke up this morning and there was like 3,000 views. So I know a lot of you guys are going to watch this replay later. Totally cool. Let's dive into the mindset of an avoidant person and we're going to work on this. Was listening to you last night at 2 a.m. That's what I mean, right there. Jeanette, thank you so much. I'm glad that you are here. All right, let's get into this. Avoidant people, why do they reject love? Chat. I want to hear from you guys. Do you guys have an answer yet? I'm going to give you the answer, but I'm going to, I want to hear from you guys. Why do you over in chat think that they reject love? Why do you think avoidant men in particular reject love? This question has been gnawing at me like crazy. I'm super excited. This is the topic. There you go, Sahara. I'm going to, I will answer you guys tonight. Okay. Thank you for the response to the email white glove. Hey, Edith, I'm here for it. I am totally here for it. Free will. Uh, that's fair. Clanza, they reject it out of free will. I hear that. I hear that. It requires something of them. Ooh, afraid of closeness. We're going to dive into that one right there, Susan. A fear of closeness, fear of commitment. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm releasing my avoidant man, how to love an avoidant man video course toward closer to the end of this month. It is coming. And in there, I discuss exactly like that. A lot of people will say fear of commitment, fear of closeness. Avoidant men scoff at that language. They, it, it actually makes them angry in some ways because they're like, how dare you accuse me, accuse me of cowardice? I am not afraid. I am practical. I track risks. And it simply is a foolish idea to jump into commitment or jump into closeness because you get nothing in return and you, 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 you risk everything. So I don't, they, don't they, they hate being labeled as afraid of commitment. It is practicality and risk assessment for them. A totally different language that avoidant people use. And that's a clue for why they reject love right there. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. A course. Great. Yeah, Lindsay, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a video course coming. A full guide, step-by-step -step for how to love an avoidant man and how in turn to get him to really cherish you and meet your needs and then desire a committed relationship with you. It's a full 
walk all the way through that start to finish. So there will be fear of vulnerability, fear of betrayal, the fear language, right? This is how we describe avoidant people is fearful, afraid, which is funny because they're some of the biggest risk takers on the planet. They have so much more guts than most other people do. They are huge in business. They're entrepreneurs. They're executives. They are gamblers. They are adrenaline junkies, some of them. There's all kinds of things. It looks too complicated for them. Mildy, you're getting so much closer. So much closer. I love that. I love that. So how the avoidant I used to say didn't say he didn't want to disappoint and let down his partner as if it was inevitable. I love this. Okay, let's get into this immediately. Why do avoidant men reject love? I want you to imagine this, okay? You don't have to close your eyes. You can watch, right? Um, I have many fancy books that you can look at. But um, I want you to imagine this. You live in a town, okay? You live in a town where everybody is obsessed with seashells. They are obsessed with seashells, okay? You don't know why. You have no desire for seashells. Everybody around you, they treat seashells as if they are the most fulfilling treasure in the entire world. They just like to hold seashells and stare at them like this all the time, just like slack jaw, drooling a little bit, staring at these seashells. They will trade gold. They will trade food. They will trade their home. They will trade their health. They will trade anything to get these seashells. Now, you've held a seashell in your hands and you're like, okay, it's all right. And they're like, no. Pull it to your ear. Listen to it. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's air moving through it. Okay. It sounds like the seashell. Okay. Well, that sounds like the ocean. That's pretty cool. And you're like, but why? Why would somebody trade everything for these seashells? This doesn't make sense to me. Okay. You don't get it. And you've seen all these people go bonkers over it. And then somebody comes to you and says, I am going to give you the biggest seashell you have ever seen in your life. And that will prove to you how valuable seashells are. And you're like, oh, what does it do? It's a seashell. And you're like, okay, well, what do you expect from me in return? Well, it's really reasonable. You're going to give me half of your stuff. I'm going to live in your house and stare at you every single day. You're going to take care of my emotional needs. And I'm going to get half of your money. And we're going to have children together. And you're going to give your life for those children endlessly. And we will be together forever. And you will never, ever have sex with anybody else ever. And I may stop having sex with you at some point. But don't worry about that because I gave you a seashell. And you're like, what? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, no. It's a big seashell. Okay. This, this is what avoidant people hear when everybody else talks about romantic love. This is what avoidant people hear when everybody talks about marriage. There's a very key reason this is happening. Avoidantly attached people have almost never experienced the same biochemistry of love that the rest of us do. In childhood, avoidantly attached people had very, very high cortisol, high stress. Now, cortisol blocks the reception of a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the warm feeling of being loved. And when you have enough of it, the research is fascinating on this, it makes you want to give affection to the people around you. Grab them, give them a hug, give them a kiss, you know, snuggle with them, rub your face on them. It makes you want to do those things. Now, they had massively high cortisol from other people being unreliable or distant or aloof, and they themselves had to protect themselves either from the world or from other people. Sometimes they, you know, had arguing parents. Their parents were just gone all the time. They never had that bonding. They had like a nanny. Maybe they had some medical trauma as a child that taught them life is going to be hard, but their brain grew up in an environment that says life will be very hard. No one will care for you. You alone are responsible for you and everybody else is unreliable. Do not bond with them. And it clicks on a survival mode, a lone wolf sort of survival mode that activates that is cortisol, high cortisol all the time that, again, blocks the reception of oxytocin. And when their cortisol gets too high, they relax by binging dopamine. Now, dopamine you can get from pretty much anywhere. You can get dopamine from a good sugary treat. You can get it from candy. You can get it from having, uh, you know, a quick casual sex. 
can get it from pornography. You can get it from, you know, decent, uh, a video game. You can get it from, you know, making money. You can get it from spending money. You can get it from, you know, all kinds of little things like quick bursts that feel good in the moment, but they don't last. Dopamine doesn't last. And it also is habit forming. So as you get more of it from certain, from new sources, you have to escalate to get more and more and more and more. You have to go up, which is why avoidant people often are adrenaline junkies and they chase bigger and bigger highs. Um, this is why they'll, they'll, well, there's a number of reasons we'll talk about, but they are on the dopamine cortisol pathway, very low oxytocin, which means very low GABA, which would suppress cortisol in the future. So they have massively high cortisol all the time. They're always scanning for threats. They are always hyper aware. They're always risk assessing always, and they can never really turn that off or calm it down. And they don't really get much serotonin either. And they discover this later. So they become really heavy into fitness, really heavy into meditation, really heavy into like anything they can do to scrape the bottom of the barrel to get the bare minimum serotonin that they should be getting in their, in their relationships with friendships, family, romance, but they don't because they don't connect in the deeper conversations that would get them there and they can't relax and come all the way down to experience it. So where, where the vast majority of the research says about 20, about 75% uh, of people who are not avoidant will get love. They will experience love as a flow of warm oxytocin and then contentment in serotonin. So warm oxytocin where they feel loved and then they, they feel spontaneously desiring to give love and affection out and then warm contentment from the serotonin, <sighs> right? This is what we experience as love. An avoidant person experiences love as, I get dopamine from you. You don't hurt me. You minimize the amount of hurt you give to me. And you're careful about that. And I will endlessly sacrifice myself and forego pleasure. And I will experience pain to provide for you. It is survival-based. It's the first two levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It is, I will give you food and shelter and safety and security. I will protect you. I will suffer for you. I will endure for you. And I will give up pleasure for you. That is my measurement of love for you. This is what they understand as love. So when you offer them love, I will give you love, the biggest love ever. Seashell. They don't understand biochemically or even cognitively what it is you're offering them. So why do avoidant men reject love? Because they don't feel the biochemistry that the rest of us do that makes us addicted to love, that makes us crave love. Now then it becomes a balancing act. If they don't experience the biochemical bonding and the fulfillment and joy and, and contentment and all of that, if it's dopamine and care and duty and responsibility, if it's very limited and if that dopamine wears off and they don't get very much as the relationship goes on, now that it's a relationship of diminishing returns where you're not likely to return that love and that connection. Women need oxytocin bonding and emotional intimacy to maintain a high libido. Her libido is going to tank. So he knows that sex drive. He doesn't know why, but he knows the sex drive is on a, a swift clock. It's going to die at one or two years. And then they're going to be together for four years. He knows that's a dying proposition. Okay. Now he's going into a permanent relationship where he's going to share everything for a really cool seashell, right? I will suffer and die for you and diminish my chances of succeeding and diminish my chances of pleasure and diminish my chances of survival for you as you diminish your what you offer to me over time and offer me less and less and less. That's what they hear. So again, fear of commitment doesn't track for them awareness of risk, and a practical assessment of diminishing returns. That's what they hear. That's the reason they reject love. That's the reason they walk away from romance. That's the reason they often will walk away from marriage. So this is why avoidant men reject love, because it feels like a death trap to them with no positive upsides or very, very few positive upsides with diminishing returns, massive risk, Massive liability. You would reject a seashell under those conditions too. Right? I will give you the biggest seashell in the whole world for everything you own and for all of your happiness for the rest of your life. Would you make that trade? 
I don't think so. You'd have to really love seashells. <laughs> and maybe some people do, but this is the problem. So, of course, the idea of giving up those short-term feelings for long-term isn't very appealing because dopamine isn't lasting. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, what about avoidance in the bedroom? Yeah, so the first six to seven months, you have novelty dopamine, which is very high because it's a new partner and it's fun. You can do lots of stuff. But at six or seven months, their dopamine starts massively tanking. So they have to do fun things to spice it up. But again, dopamine-based things, right? Clothing, actions, uh, new partners involved, multiple partners involved. Uh, all kinds of fantasies and 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 uh, they used to call them marital aids. Uh, all kinds of things have to get involved to boost the dopamine, but even that's a temporary fix, right? It's all a temporary fix. So at 12 months, they're really not feeling much pleasure or joy. And neither is she, by the way. At 12 months, her drive will, will drop off a cliff because her brain says, he doesn't love me. He's not exhibiting oxytocin. He's not exhibiting affection. All he does is talk about how he suffers for me, but he doesn't open up to me. He doesn't share with me. He doesn't bond with me. He doesn't do the things I expect him to do. He's signaling to me that he doesn't love me. So her, her drive tanks like into the ground and then confirms his worst fears. And then she starts saying, I can't keep doing this unless we have a commitment. He's like, why would I commit to this? It's just getting worse. It's already getting worse. And she says, yeah, it's getting worse because you won't commit. And he's like, that doesn't make sense. It's not going to get better. Our dopamine is just going to dwindle. So why are you pushing me into commitment? And she's like, no, we, we need a commitment. We need to be bonding. I'm bonded to you. Why aren't you bonded to me? And you're like, what the heck do you mean? Why are you doing this to me? Don't you see how much I'm suffering for you? I'm miserable for you. I could be out there doing anything else, but I'm here with you instead. Doesn't that show how much I love you? And she's like, really? Your measurement of loving me is just not having sex with other people? If this conversation sounds familiar, it's like you're narrating my life. So how this, this is avoidant attachment. Princess, Barbie, good to see you. How do they change this chemical imbalance? This is a key. This is a massive key to being able to uh, fix avoidant attachment style. This is exactly what I aim to do. How early or late can attachment be impacted? Uh, birth, like starting within minutes. Um, my mom died when I was 15. Dad became distant. Could that have changed me to avoid an attachment? Trauma responses and, and massive betrayals in the relationship can. Um, but if dad dad's tendency was to pull away anyway, he may already have been avoidant or had attachment issues. So you already had some attachment challenges and the trauma brought them into the forefront and made them worse. But that, that can also happen. That can 100% also happen. Thank you for the, uh, thank you for the donation, by the way. Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, how do they change chemical imbalance? So the way avoidant people stop rejecting love is number one, to even learn that there is another way to live. Remember, their brain formed under the idea that no one will ever care for them or support them or love them. And this is simply survival and they have to survive for the rest of their life. So it, it clicks on a natural lone wolf survival mode that all of us have. It clicks it on for them. And their assumption is this is natural. This is practical. I am doing the right thing. I am being smart. Everyone else is foolish. Everyone else is obsessed with seashells, but I am not. I'm going to be smart and practical. So when someone comes along, hey, feelings, emotions, seashells are great. You should have seashells all over your house and share seashells and give up your home for seashells. And you should just blindly sign contracts with people to form seashells and build more seashells, right? It sounds stupid. But when I start talking about the brain's biochemistry, when I start talking to avoidant people about, have you ever been truly happy? And I don't mean pleasure, I mean really fulfilled. Have you been able to ever sit and sink into a moment with somebody that you cared about? Do you have a frame of reference for who to trust and why, how to measure somebody's trustworthiness? Do you know how to build emotional intimacy with the right people so that you can get your needs met in relationships in a way that makes them respect you more? Do you understand why everybody else is obsessed with love? And is it possible that you have missed something? Not because you're deficient, but that you yourself are missing an experience that 75% of the human race does experience, but 25% who are avoidantly attached, by the way, the research shows, 25% do not experience. Is it possible that you could select one person who is worthy of trust and measure that Bring the risk factors down, connect with them, invest with them, have them invest in you and form a reciprocal bond that is deeper than temporary dopamine 
and foster a connection that could last. Is that possible? And they start saying, well, it doesn't seem probable, but I can't say it's impossible. Tell me more about these biochemicals. So I talk with them more about the biochemistry. What's fascinating is once they learn the framework of trust, the four levels of trust, and once they identify one person in their life they like to try this with, then I say, okay, you're going to practice something called solution-focused sharing. You're going to go to them and share a challenge you're having and get some insight from them and invite them temporarily into your life to share some context with them so that you are known and understood and show respect for them for their wisdom, but guide them in and help help get some solving pro some solving on your solutions are your problems and then build a reciprocal relationship where you're a little bit more open with each other you're going to test this then you're going to build some mutual fulfillment into relationships you're going to make them make sense you're going to be clear and open about your needs and then you're going to see how people respond to that and as they experience this they actually start releasing oxytocin very quickly uh, they start getting serotonin and they can actually feel the changes in their body and their brain. They're weirded out the first time. It's so impactful, but so weird at the same time. Uh, they also start releasing a hormone called vasopressin. So vasopressin bonds you as you reduce that cortisol level with another person. Your brain tags that person as a trustworthy ally who helped you bring down your stress by solving a problem. So doing this, vasopressin bonds them as well. Vasopressin, serotonin, and oxytocin then releases GABA and it starts preventing them from spiraling up into those massively high levels of cortisol. A lot of them are afraid this is going to take their edge away so that they can't perform in jobs anymore. It doesn't. It actually, a lot of my executive clients, my coaching clients who come in, they're at high level executive positions like C-suite, CEOs, COOs, CTOs, and they come in and say, Adam, I've climbed through the ranks. The dopamine cortisol thing helped me climb through the ranks, but now it's shredding my relationships at the top. I don't know how to maintain relationships with the other executives. They're getting resentful toward me. I don't know how to maintain healthy relationships with the people below me. And it actually matters because I don't have anywhere else to climb. I have to work with these people for the next 10 years. And I don't know how to build in and foster the next generation because they're just leaving. The talent has no loyalty to me at all because I haven't built and fostered that relationship. So I can't function at this high level and maintain it. Dopamine helps you climb the mountain, but if you don't convert to serotonin and oxytocin bonding appropriately, you will fall back down the mountain painfully. So you need to build your home at that top of the mountain once you reach there so you can sustain. That's what the healthy attachment builds for you. So avoidant men who reject love on the way up the mountain find that they crave it when they hit this point and that it, it actually is overwhelmingly important for them to build it at this point. Otherwise, they won't be able to maintain what they have fostered. So plus the cortisol pathways will actually burn out your all kinds of problems. You're going to face heart problems at 50, uh, per potentially cancer problems at 55, like early death, like check out at 20 years, you know, 20 years early, 30 years early, a lot of medical problems and you spend all your money that you've built doing that. Um, but fostering secure attachment earlier helps you maintain at this level and then perform at a sustainable level where people thrive in your presence and you foster other people instead of you having a lone wolf at all the time, if that makes sense. Um, that is where they start appreciating love. Because I will say this, this may be controversial, but I'll say this, no avoidant person or no, no one on earth is as appreciative as love of love once they experience it as an avoidant person who has lived without it for their entire life, their entire life. Okay. They be, they are very attentive. They're hyper aware. They're very sensitive to changes in their environment and they always have been, but then it converts into using that to nurture the people in their life and build bonds and protect their family and care for the emotional intimacy that other people now they recognize need. As they build that, they themselves achieve mutual fulfillment and reciprocal care. It's a very, very important process and it's doable. It's, it's overwhelming at times biochemically to them and they need to take a step back and breathe, but then they can step back in. Um, I work with children of avoidant parents and, and I guide them through it, guide the whole family through it. But I work with a lot of avoidant men as they go through this process. So a lot of guys come to me um, as their marriage is beginning to fall apart. They've made the choice to enter marriage, but they didn't, didn't know how to maintain it or build emotional intimacy. And then at you know, 10, 15, even 20 years of marriage, it's starting to fall apart. And they come to me and say, Adam, look, I'm, I'm facing like a, you know, like a $300,000 loss financially, but also losing this woman that I love and my kids and losing everything. Like, please just fix me. And we just run through the process of fixing it, like an eight session coaching package that, that fixes that really quick marriage rescue package for that. But no, it's fixing avoidant attachment is very possible. 
the biggest problem though is getting them to believe it's even possible because it's again it's a survival adaptation i'm telling you hey look seashells it's perfect you need eight of them and they're like all right who's the charlatan why is he selling these seashells but as they sink into it and learn more about it they start saying well maybe there's actually something here now if every seashell was filled with like you know the fountain of youth kind of water that will keep you alive or if every seashell when you scrape off a little bit it's made of solid diamond and it's worth everything right all of a sudden those seashells there's there's a piece of there that you didn't see before right there's there's incredible gift and incredible value in these seashells that you didn't realize was there before absolutely important that you be able to have that uh, Princess Barbie, he agreed to watch one of your shows a week and have a discussion. That's amazing. I hope he's watching this one. This replay will go up. Uh, thousands of people will watch it later, which is pretty cool. Definitely check out this replay with him, Princess Barbie. This was a good one. Um, 100%. I also do have uh, a video on this channel called What Men with Avoidant Attachment Style Need to Be Happy. It's my most watched video of all time. I think it's currently sitting at like 60,000, 65,000. It's like climbing astronomically every day. It's going to be one of my first to probably crack 100,000. Um, I would go watch that video with him. Some avoidant men cry when they watch it. I'll talk about the chemicals. That's usually what gets in the avoidant guys. Alicia, if they've done well up to this point, successful, I don't think they see the reward in changing. They usually don't. Uh, but it's as things start to fall apart, as things start to fall apart, um, everything starts to die. And everything starts to to crash around them, and, and it tears their life apart. That's really where it gets terrible. Can we help them understand by appealing to their logic? Yes. So as part of, so I'm building my video course, how to love an avoidant man. Inside there, it talks about how to how to explain the value of relationships. Those seashells. How to explain the value of relationships to them. How to logically explain to them the value of emotional intimacy how to logically explain to them your emotional needs in a way they'll understand and measure and how to explain to them the value of a committed relationship and then how to bring down the risk factors in the relationship. I go step like detailed information about how to speak an avoidant man's language. No manipulation. The course is not about manipulation at all. It is about really having authentic loving and sincere conversations with him, but in a way he will understand, in a language he will speak, in a way that fosters that real connection between the two of you. So I've, uh, I've, it's information that I've used in session with a lot of my male coaching clients, and they thrive when they hear it. I had, I had a young couple just two weeks ago, they came in, she was hurt and upset. She was very anxiously attached. He was like, really, he was like, he was like this at the beginning of the session away from her. And she was just like, you know, that the huddle that women do where they draw their knees up and they have their, their pillow and they're just like, their eyes are squinted, but they're, they're looking at him out of the corner of their eye as I'm talking to them. And he's looking at me, but she's looking at him. You know that, that you know, the body posture. Um, and it was, we are fighting a lot. He doesn't care about my feelings. And she is being completely irrational. I don't understand where she's coming from and why she's picking fights. It's because he tells me my feelings don't matter and I'm fi I've finally had enough and can't take it anymore. So I had to explain to him how her feelings are, are a thermometer for the relationship. What she feels and senses, it doesn't matter if it's factual or not, if he can logically argue it away. She is sensing something that's off in the relationship and he needs to take uh, have awareness of her sense and that feeling and then deal with that feeling and then help her to help correct that feeling that's happening in the relationship and that she needs to speak to him not about just raw feelings she needs to speak to him in a way that really draws out the the meaning like the logic the measurableness of her needs how to make her desires measurable and clear so that he can do them so it doesn't feel like endless moving goalposts if she says, I need you to make me feel loved, he will have no idea what that means. Like through the course of this video, I hope you guys understand why. If you tell an avoidant man, you have to feel loved, you need to make me feel loved, you are doomed. There is no way on earth he's going to know what to do. He'll try to give you dopamine, chocolates, flowers, a back rub. Like he'll, he'll try to like, just like give you good pleasure. He will have no idea how to make you feel loved because he has never really felt loved himself. Okay, keep that in mind. 
I don't think people realize how much chronic fatigue is part of avoiding attachment. So, yeah, 100% because you're burning yourself out. Your adrenals are burned out. Your cortisol is maxing all the time. And the only mechanism you have for managing is dopamine. This is why a lot of avoidant men end up micro cheating through Instagram, through, you know, all kinds of things. But this is how they, why they end up looking at pornography. This is why they end up, you know, messaging, DMing pretty girls or having a secret OnlyFans or something on the side. Well, they don't do OnlyFans as much. Usually they're, they go for the free stuff because <laughs> they're smarter with money. Some of them check out OnlyFans. Most of them do not. Um, no, this is this is the pathway, you guys, to fixing avoidant attachment, though. It, it's why they reject love, because they don't recognize the value of it because they've never really felt it. When you can make it measurable for them, when you can bring down the risk factors and really build that in, and then when you can help them understand uh, what intimacy and emotional connection feels like, and you can guide them forward into that. It is like someone who has, have you ever seen those videos of like the little kids who can't hear the, the deaf children and then they give them the cochlear implants and then they turn them on and they hear like their parents voice for the first time. And the kid is like, like freaked out and they freeze for like 30 seconds. They can't even move their eyes. And then they start like moving and then they start like crying and then they start hugging their family. That's really what it's like when an avoidant person starts feeling oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin, GABA. When they switch from the, the survival pathway into the thriving pathway, into like the connecting pathway, into the, the living and sustaining pathway, from hardcore lone wolf survival mode into the mode that humans are meant to live in. Because this is a temporary mode, or it's a mode for like horrific environments. This is where you're supposed to live, where your body replenishes, where you sleep at night and your brain replenishes, where your immune system rests, where, where your, your body even like handles misfolded proteins differently. So you don't develop cancerous cells uh, or misfolded proteins in, even in your brain to start handling al Alzheimer's and things like that uh, and, and, and undoing that. There's a, that's fascinating research on that. But switching from this to this pathway is incredible. It, it's amazing to see avoidant people really do that. So uh, that's, that is that, you guys. I'm going to click over now into members only chat mode, and I'm going to take some hardcore questions from you guys about avoidant attachment. If you want to become a member, if you want to hit me with some questions right now, down here at the bottom, my camera's reversed. So I, it's somewhere in here. There's a button that says join. When you click that button, you have multiple options about what you want to activate. You can get in the inner circle with me, or you can hit join and just support the channel. Either way, I really am grateful for that. Keep in mind, as we're headed toward 50,000 subscribers, I'm going to be giving one of my, one of you most engaged people, a five session coaching package with me. Do not forget that because I appreciate you guys and all that you have done for me. Adam, please do a video on how to communicate. Uh, 100% Lindsay. So I have that inside the How to Love an Avoidant Man video course. It is coming very soon. I, it's already in production with my team. I fully filmed it in a, in a professional studio with my production team and my producer and everything on site. And we built the course to be very, very useful and practical to show you how to communicate with him, how to show him why you are the one true love in his life and authentically authentically, how to build real trust with him for life, and then how to move him in a non-manipulative way toward full loving commitment so that you can build that loving, intimate relationship where you get your needs met and he gets his needs met for the rest of your lives together. That's what that video course is going to have. It's going to have a very special launch price. Do not miss this. I'm going to be blast. You can't miss it. I'm going to be blasting about it everywhere on every channel. So if you have questions about this, I'm here to help. That course is coming real soon. Members, what questions do you have over there in chat? Hit me with those questions. I'm here for them. Uh, Milda, I anxious. Okay. Talked with my avoidant boyfriend today about how we understand love. His answers are almost exact words you said. You're the avoidant man whisperer. Oh, I, I, I've become that. Shockingly, surprisingly. Brad, thank you so much for joining as a member. I appreciate you. Hit me with your questions that you have. I am here to answer them. Thank you so much. Uh, Milda, yes. So I would watch this video with him. If I was you, this video will go up on the channel the moment we're done. You can watch this replay with him. I would watch this and then ask him some questions. Drive with some conversation. Princess Barbie, he says he wants to concentrate on himself and learn about relationships. What's he really saying? Uh, he is used to solving problems alone. He has never solved problems with people. He thinks he has to completely disconnect and solve a problem utterly alone. And that's how he's going to learn about relationships. 
It doesn't make sense, but it's the only mechanism he has for solving problems. Um, I have this video course coming very soon, Princess Barbie. It is designed for anxious women and secure women who love an avoidant man, but it is also designed to be fully accessible for avoidant men to watch it and say, yes, this is a relationship I want. I finally understand what a loving relationship would look like. So I recommend picking up that course when it comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, watch it with him. It's going to gain, it's going to change the game for you guys completely. I would watch that with him, to be honest with you. Uh, where can we find information on avoidant kids and avoidant teenagers? Does your course will support parent-kid relationships? You know, um, good question. So I don't, I haven't done a tremendous amount on parenting. Uh, I do, I will work on some of that in the future. This course will be helpful for avoidant people. I'm just going to say that it will probably help with. Uh, Avoidant women as well. I know the course will help with avoidant women as well. It's geared specifically toward avoidant men, but it will work with other people who are avoidant. So yes, it should help. Um, as far as that, Natalia, if you have an avoidant child, do you yourself have some attachment challenges, maybe anxious attachment? The answer for you might actually be fixing your attachment. And my attachment boot camp video course is probably the right move for you in that regard. And it's very accessible for teenagers. You can watch it with them and have conversations after every video in the attachment boot camp for fixing attachment issues together as a family. A lot of families take that course and watch it together. Thank you, Isabella St. Andrews. I appreciate you for being a member and supporting the channel. Thank you so much. I'll answer your question here in just a moment. Milda, he was empathetic, also told me being silly by trying to make things more complex than they should be. He said that I rushed our relationship We're together for five months. Totally with you, Milda. Um, I would, again, watch that video on my channel, what avoid what men with an avoidant attachment style need to be happy. Um, I would watch that video and send it to him and, or sit and watch it with him and say, is this a relationship you want? If it is, I have a course coming that will show you guys how to build it very, very simply. Isabella, how do you know avoidant men have never felt real love before? They would have married her if they did. Uh, it's because that is the feature of avoidant attachment style is to have that survival mode clicked on. They have maximum high cortisol all the time. Uh, through the work of Dr. Sue Carter from the Institute, the Kinsey Institute, we know that massively high cortisol blocks the, the reception of oxytocin. Uh, and that they themselves, when they come into sessions with me, I've worked with thousands of women over the, over the years, uh, first as a therapist, now as a coach on the internet, now as a, an attachment specialist coach. Um, they tell me that they've never really felt that, that contentment, that love, that fulfillment. It's an alien feeling to them. It's like, hey, have you ever seen the color red? And they're like, what the heck is red? And I've never seen red. Red's not real. That's what it is for them. I've worked with them personally. I know it. He really liked the additional stipulations of the prenup. You mentioned another video. There you go, Princess Barbie. Love it. Love to hear that. He's open to some ideas. That's great. So how I love it. At what point do you step away from an avoidant who continues to self-sabotage or deactivate by ghosting when there have been healthy behaviors? You say, I would love to build a loving and sustainable relationship with you that is mutually fulfilling. I need you to take some steps toward that as well. Is that what you want? And if so, here are some things I will need from you. What will you need from me in return? And you make a very clear, logical calm agreement to work together. And if he violates that, he is telling you he doesn't want that. At some point, you need to make that decision for yourself. I can't tell you a number, not eight years, please, please, for the love of God, not eight years. People come to me at eight years all the time. Is he ever going to marry me? Probably not. Um, build that conversation and then decide how much time you can allot to that. That is my advice. I'm avoidant. I'm getting love bombed by my ex. Any advice? You are avoidant and you're getting love bombed by an ex. That sounds like your ex is probably the disorganized style where they are more avoidant than you, but also have some anxious behaviors as well. They may have a personality disorder. I'm not sure. But if you're avoidant, getting out avoidanced by another person and love bombed to death, um, that usually means they are much, much, much more manipulative than you are. You might be the ethical avoidant type where you don't manipulate and love bomb people. Uh, my advice, honestly, run. Uh, you are going to start experiencing oxytocin bonding. That's one of the few times that it can really be inflicted on a person with avoidant attachment when someone is massively worse than they are. Uh, it's, it's like a big predator coming along and taking a bite out of you and biting right through your armor. Typically they're not always bad. And I'm not, I don't, I don't mean to say it like they always are, but in all my experience, this is where avoidant people come to me where they are wounded and they say, I got destroyed by this person. What the heck do I do? And what was this? So I would take a pause there, Brad, not go back with your ex, but take this opportunity to learn about secure attachment and become secure. That's what I would do. 
Francis, are avoidant, stubborn, or controlling? As each time things would be nearing him to ghost me, he would become controlling. You say passive aggressive comments. That sounds like, so there's a spectrum of avoidant. Um, ethical avoidant. My hands are reversed. This is my left. It doesn't really matter. Ethical avoidant people are on this side of the spectrum, and they do not want to hurt anyone or manipulate anyone. They just don't want to get hurt. So they usually stay out of relationships, or they might be in some. But as you slide down the spectrum of avoidant behavior, you become the, the person, as, as the person slots in at different types uh, on that, there are more and more manipulative and narcissistic traits down to a very, very, very manipulative avoidant person. And off that scale is more like personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, sociopathic behavior. Those are off the scale over here, okay? Um, keep that in mind. This is the scale of avoidant attachment. F people ask about fearful avoidant. They're up here. That's actually disorganized. They're on their own scale over here. Um, but this is the scale of avoidant attachment, okay? Your ex sounds like they slot in on the very manipulative side, Francis, okay? Or if that's your ex, that's what that sounds like. Princess Barbie, Min Milda, five months is nothing to them. Five months is when they start dying off with dopamine. Their dopamine attraction starts really dwindling to you. You are no longer getting the novelty dopamine of, hey, look, it's a new partner. Hey, look, it's a new body. Hey, look, it's new, you know, body parts. Hey, look, it's a new face. Hey, look, it's new, you know, whatever. The dopamine starts to die off. And that's where they are like, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe we're moving too fast. Maybe we should slow down. That's where they start doing that because it stops feeling as good to them. And they're like, why don't I feel good? Why don't I feel butterflies? Why don't I feel connected to you? I'm not feeling the chemistry anymore. It's really starting to die for me. I don't think we're a good match anymore. That's where they really start pumping those brakes is five to seven months, to be honest with you. So very, very common, unfortunately. Very fixable. <laughs> that's where oxytocin bonding is, is really crucial to start kicking in. And, and that's, again, the thing that they don't get. So there you guys go. What other questions do you guys have for me? I love these questions. This is fantastic. And again, thank you, members, for supporting the channel like this. You support me. I want to support you right back with these questions and answers like this here at the end. Um, I will be back with more answers about this. I am working on the Avoidant Man course. I've got emails packed up in my email right now from my team saying, what do you want to do about this? What do you want to do about that? I'm building out the exercises for in between the videos, practical, exact exercises, exact conversations to have with key phrases you need to use, step-by-step um, -step analysis structures and, and assessment pieces for different levels of the relationships all kinds of things inside there. I'll be building that out here in the next couple of days as well. So work, well, the work continues. I'll have that course for you guys very, very quickly. What's disorganized attachment? It means cannot be neatly organized into avoidant or anxious. It means it's a blend of the two. That's also called fearful avoidant. It's also called anxious dash avoidant. It's its own specific thing where they flip back and forth between anxious and avoidant at different relationship pieces or at different experiences. That's what fearful avoidant is. It's, it's off on its own thing. That's disorganized attachment. Uh, how do I get him to ask me out on dates? I'm doing too much by asking him out. No, um, honestly, sitting him down and saying, hi, it probably doesn't occur to you to ask me on dates because that's probably not something that means a lot to you. Not that you don't care, but you probably don't have the experience and the awareness of like, hey, I should ask them on a date, oxytocin. So I am letting you know it is very important to me to be asked on dates because it shows me that I'm a priority to you and that you care about me. It makes me feel loved. I use the what, why, and how often method. That's the what. Why? Because it makes me feel loved and cared for. It's really important to me. How often? It would really mean a lot to me if every two to three weeks you could ask me out on a date or every month, once a month, take me out on our monthly couples date, whatever it is. It would mean a lot to me if you could ask me out on these dates about that often. Could you please do this for me? right? What, why, how often? That's one of the pieces inside my, my course is, is talking to them that way so that they can understand. When you make your needs measurable and help them understand why it's a priority, it can they can start tracking it in. At this point, a lot of women say, well, he's just following a checklist. That feels awful. What you're tracking is that he has low oxytocin and you want high oxytocin. But understand that checking things off a list and going through that with you actually is his measurement of love early on. So if you just throw that out and tell him that's not good enough, he has to want to date you, then he's done. At that point, he's done because you're trying to force him to have a feeling and you can't make him do that. But you can follow through on a loving relationship with him and start fostering that connection together with him, even if it's a checklist at first. Because then you could say, 
I really appreciate this. This was so kind of you. Thank you for taking me on this date. It means a lot. How can I care for you in return? And he's like, what? Nobody's ever fair to me. What do you mean? Like, it's just, I was just trying to make you happy. No, I would really like to be fair for you in return. What fulfills you? What makes you feel good in return? What can I do? That will stop him in his tracks. Again, it's part of the course. I have that inside the course. So there we go. Great questions here tonight, you guys. If you have any more questions, pop them in in the next 30 seconds. Otherwise, I'm headed off and I'm going to start working on the attachment man, avoidantly attached man video course again. I have more tasks to accomplish inside there and I'm loving it because I am packing it with things that you guys need. I am packing it with like, oh, they need this. Oh, this will be great. Oh, here's an exercise. This is perfect. This will help them. Oh, this phrase is great. And I'm packing it in. So I'm I'm loving it. I'm so excited to get this course in your guys' hands. Please, please, please keep your eyes peeled for the next few weeks. You should not be able to miss it once I launch it. But it'll be here. I didn't used to have to do this. Now I don't feel loved. Yeah. Uh, honestly, Princess Barbie, that's the dopamine is dwindling. And that's what you're experiencing. And it's not replaced with oxytocin. So that's that's what you're going through. Francis, thank you for your help. You are very welcome. Keep in mind, anybody that needs help, anybody that needs coaching, anybody that needs a course recommendation, like which course to take, anybody that has informa wants information about the Avoid Man video course, anyone that wants information about my ongoing year-long mentorship program with group coaching calls, um, anything that you guys need, please email me. It's support at adamlanesmith.com. You can also drop comments down below. I'll handle those. I, I handle the support email like eight, five, eight times a day, all the time. So if you send me an email at the support at adamlanesmith.com, I'll get you taken care of. If you need coaching, you need personal direct help. I'm here for that as well. Have a good night, Adam. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. We appreciate you. Night. Hey, thank you, you guys. I appreciate you. Thank you to our new members. I really appreciate you. Again, thank you so much. Keep in mind, when we hit 50,000 followers on the subscribers on this channel, I will be giving away a free five-session coaching pack to the person who is most engaged and most desiring to learn about attachment. I want to make sure that the one person who loves attachment the most gets the most help. So comment, subscribe, turn on notifications, hit that little bell notification ringer. If you guys would, it pushes notifications through. So you get all the notifications on my new videos. When I go live, all of that, I will be back live again next week, uh, Tuesday night, 7 PM us central time, Tuesday night, 7 PM us central time. I will be here. Thank you so much, you guys. I will be here again. Talk to you very soon.